to everyone tonight, and those of you, if you are a guest with us tonight, we're so glad to have you in service with us this evening. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. If you're watching us online, wherever you may be watching from, we pray that you're blessed by this service tonight as well. In Jesus' name. I, I, I just, I want to, I want to say something and just tag off of uh, something Brother uh, Dowdy said. I believe it was on Sunday morning. I, I, in, in, in electricity, and we got electricians in here, so you guys will just have to tolerate me. I'm sure you can explain this way better than I, but, but in electricity, there's, there's, what's called the closed circuit. And the closed circuit means that there is a complete electrical connection around which current flows or circulates. Can I, can I tell you, I believe that, that the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God is supposed to be a closed circuit. And, and what that means is, and, and, and at the risk of sounding self-serving, I don't, I can, the Lord knows my heart, that's all that matters. Responding to preaching is not about personality. It's about closing the circuit. Your, your amen is an affirmation. It is a... It's come my way, so I'm sending back. And I appreciate Brother Barr and a few others of you that can be counted on. But a bunch of you, you never close the circuit. And faith is not confirmed by mental assent. Well, I believe what you're preaching and I, in my head. I, no. The Scripture says... We believe, therefore we speak. I realize some, well, it's just culture, it's just this and that, and, and, and perhaps for some it is. But I, I, just, I, just, I just want to challenge us to not become a congregation where a few people, amen, and the rest are silent, because there, there needs to be that, that closing of the circuit. Hebrews says that the Word of God did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Your, your amen is a mixing of faith. Amen's just not the word to end your pre-dinner prayer with. In fact, in, 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 the, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, I believe it is, chapter 27, in verse 15 through 26, it is, amen is repeated. I believe it's in every verse. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. All the people, it said. So, so let's, let's not let it become just so that we got a few Ameners at Antioch Central. But I think it ought to be the majority that, that there are times in the ministry of the Word of God, no matter who's in this pulpit, that there is a response from the congregation that says, Amen. That, that, in essence, it's a taking a personal ownership to. This would be a really great night just to preach an exciting throwdown message after that. But, so... I just, Brother, Brother Dowdy, I forget exactly, he said something along those lines, and it just, he just kind of brushed over it, but it, it just kind of stuck a little bit. So I, I, I want to I challenge you and encourage you that, that you individually need to make that connection. And, you know, well, that's just not my personality. Let me tell you something. I don't want to hear the personality excuse. What I do up here every single service is not personality. <laughs> so, if I can do this, you can do that. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Psalms 27. Psalm 27. and I'll Read the first couple of verses of this psalm. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. In verse number 4, one thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. Father, I thank You for Your presence in this place tonight. Thank You for the opportunity You've given us again to join together with believers, fellow saints, and enter into Your presence. Thank You for Your Spirit that You've manifested in this place tonight. I pray, God, that You would speak to our hearts and our lives tonight. Give us hearts that would be good ground for Your Word tonight, that You might be able to produce in and through us what You desire. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust You tonight. I depend on You, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Psalm 63, verse 1, David says, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see Thy power and Thy glory so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. Psalm 139 and 23, David prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 42 and verse 1 is not accredited per se to David, but I think it sounds very similar to these verses we've already read. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after Thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I, I, I want to talk to you tonight a little bit. I don't know that this is necessarily a title or the title, but, but I want to talk to you a little bit tonight, or hopefully the Lord will talk to us a little bit tonight and, 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 and hear my context of this. But our job is positioning, not pursuing. Now, I don't mean that in the context of relationship with God, because obviously... In, a, in the context of relationship with God, you, you ought to be pursuing God. When I say that our job is positioning, not pursuing, I'm afraid that too many folks have get, gotten caught up in not pursuing God, but pursuing position. Worried about what you are called to do. We're worried about what role you're going to be given. Worried about what title you're going to be given. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. Not a position, not a title, not a role. But the thing that I will seek after is I've got to be in His presence. I, I've got to be in His temple. I've got to be in the sanctuary. I've got to interact with the presence of God. That, that's the positioning I'm talking about. Your job and my job is to make sure we get in the right position because if we can get in the right position, God can take care of the position. 
If we'll get in the right place we're supposed to be with God, you don't have to worry about God getting you in a position or a role or a title. I, I, I'm afraid if we're not careful, we get so caught up even in ministry that our focus becomes ministry roles when our focus has got to be first and foremost, God, I've got to have you. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O oh God. I realize it's a dog-eat-dog world, as they say. And I realize that in the, in the, in the, in, in your, on your job and, and in the workplace, you, you may have to work on and strive for getting a position, a role, a title. But I'm telling you, in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. In the kingdom of God, you need to focus your passion on one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. I've got to learn how all by my... Thank you for what we... We do, God, when we come together in these atmospheres. But I've got to learn how to do it by myself. I've got to learn how to find a place where no one else is. And I've got to pursue after you and make up my mind. I've got to have you, God. I've got to be in your presence. I've got to encounter you. Not so that I can have a position or a title or a role. But I've just got to have you. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I wonder if we got anybody around here tonight that says, God, let me just be a doorkeeper. I'm okay with being a doorkeeper if that means I'm close to your presence, if that means I'm nearby where you're working. I, I don't need to be a pastor, an assistant pastor. God, I'm content with just being a doorkeeper. I've come to tell you tonight, if you will work on, if you will pursue the, the responsibility of positioning yourself, God will take care of positioning you in a role or a place. You don't have to campaign for it. You don't have to rub shoulders with the right people to get it. I know you know the story, but let me read it to you anyway. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning with verse number 1. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I, whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? You know what, there's a, there's a healthy sense that when the prophet shows up, When somebody that operates in a prophetic anointing shows up, there ought to be a little bit of trepidation that says, hey, are you, are you coming for good reasons or bad reasons? He said peaceably. I, 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 I saw a clip today on, on Instagram. Forgive me for looking at Instagram on a Sunday on the Lord's Day, but I did. And it was, uh, it was an author, if I named his name, some of you would know, but he said he was sent to a... He was sent uh, years ago, he was sent to visit uh, a, a man who had been a very prominent preacher, had had a very successful worldwide, world-renowned ministry, and, and he had fallen into immorality, and, and uh, not just immorality, but misuse of funds, and, and he, he was in jail, and he, he, sent, he, he, was, he was requested to come and visit, I think he said, and he went to see this guy, and in the course of conversation, he, he asked him this, he, he, he asked the pastor, he said, when did, you, when, did you, when, when did you lose your love for God? And he said, the, the pastor responded to him, he said, I, I didn't. He said, I was shocked by that response, and he could see the shock on my face. He said, I never lost my love for God. 
but I lost my fear of God. We need to love God, but there's also a healthy sense of fearing God. Reverence and respect for God. I, I heard this. I I I I I I heard this song a couple days on the Christian radio, and it's one of the newer songs. And when it ended, the host was all awesome about it. And 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 I don't remember the I don't remember the artist that was singing it, but but the gist of the song, one of the main lines was something about thanking or something like that. The the man on the middle cross. You know what? On the right hand and on the left, there were some men on those crosses. But why do we want to bring the one in the middle down to being the man on the cross? That was God manifested in flesh on the cross. I don't understand why we've got this trend to bring God down to where we are. I'd rather not, God, I'd rather not bring down God to being one of my pals, one of my buddies. I'd rather God reach down to me in the midst of all of this chaos and turmoil that we're in and lift me up out of it. In fact, did He not say, if I be lifted up, I will draw. He said, peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord and sanctify, sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they, when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as the man as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and beholdeth, he keepeth the sheep. Surely it, it can't be him. He's the youngest. He's the least significant out of the bunch. In fact, he's, he's so insignificant, he's just taking care of the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come. And he sent and he brought him. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and appointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. David did not become the next king of Israel because he was pursuing becoming the king of Israel. David did not get selected by God because he, he was rubbing shoulders with the right people. In fact, I don't think David even had a clue there was the possibility that he, as the youngest of his brothers and the one taking care of sheep, that he could become the next king of Israel. But David had been working on positioning himself in the right place and that right place was with a hunger and with a relationship with God. I fear that if we're not careful, we can bypass, bypass the establishing of some very important elements as we jump into ministry roles. I'm thankful for the way in which uh, CMI especially has provided an outlet for ministry for our young adults and and, and other areas that have provided outlets of ministry. But can I just challenge you tonight? Don't let a ministry opportunity cause you to overlook learning how to build a prayer life. Don't let the fact that you, you're teaching some Bible studies and, and don't let the fact that you get some opportunities to sing and do other things, don't let that cause you to think you don't need to learn how to find you someplace 
all by yourself, just you and Jesus, and learn how to communicate with Him. And sometimes you got to do what Jacob did, and you got to wrestle with Him. Sometimes you got to get all by yourself and make up your mind, God, I will not leave this place until something happens between you and me. It's one thing for something to happen when we gather together, and that is important, but you've got to learn how to do it on your own. David wasn't in a crowd of people saying this is what we desire. He says, one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. And because he worked on positioning himself, when it came time to select somebody to take Saul's place, God said, I know exactly the one. know exactly the one <laughs> take note I know nothing's nothing new for most of you but but take note where David was when when he was brought in to get anointed to be king <laughs> you know the story of Elisha most of you know the story of Elisha I won't take time to really read it but God sends Elijah out and as he's journeying he sees Elisha and he takes his mantle and he throws his mantle onto Elisha and and when that mantle fell on Elisha it, it appears as though something awoke inside of him that that was that that anointing that authority in that mantle when it when it touched Elisha he he came to life and he responds and he says to Elijah, hold on, I, I'm, I'm coming with you. Elijah responds, he said, what, what have I done to you? He knew, he knew exactly what happened. Elijah knew exactly what happened. He says, what, what did I do to you? He says, let me go, let me go tell my family bye and I'm, 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 I'm coming after you. He was, he was out in the field plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Easton's Bible Dictionary says this about Elisha, and I've, I've always kind of wondered, I don't know about you, maybe you already knew this, but I guess I think I had it, Brother Isaac, I think I had it kind of set in my subconscious that when after Elijah threw that mantle on Elisha, that it was just, you know, maybe a couple of weeks or so at the most that, that Elisha went from the field and, and then next thing you know, it's Elijah being taken up in the whirlwind and his mantle falls to the ground and, and Elisha picks it up and he picks up his ministry right, right where Elijah left off. But, but as I read this, I learned something. The name Elisha mean God, means God, his salvation. Elisha was the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, who became the attendant and disciple of Elijah. His name first occurs in the command given to Elijah to, to anoint him as his successor. This was the only one of the three commands then given to Elijah, which he accomplished. On his way from Sinai to Damascus, he found Elisha at his native place, engaged in the labors of the field, plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. He, he didn't find him in the prayer room. He didn't find him on a 40-day fast. He, he didn't find him at youth camp or youth congress or pause. Or, he found him just out in the field, plowing with oxen. He went over to him, threw over his shoulders his rough mantle, and at once adopted him as a son and invested him with the prophetical office. Elisha accepted the call thus given about four years before the death of Ahab, and for some seven or eight years became the close attendant on Elijah till he was parted from him and taken up into heaven. During all these years, we hear nothing of Elisha except in connection with the closing scenes of Elijah's life. 
after Elijah, Elisha was accepted as the leader of the sons of the prophets and became a noted and became noted in Israel. He possessed, according to his own request, a double portion of Elijah's spirit and for the long period of about 60 years held the office of prophet of Israel. Seven or eight years. The Bible references the sons of the prophets. It, it really kind of the first reference as Samuel makes, except it references them, I think, as the company of the prophets, but it's a similar thing. And, and several places, this, the sons of the prophets are mentioned. And, and in essence, it's the school of the prophets. The King James doesn't call it that, but if you look it up, if you study it, it it's in essence what it was. The sons of the prophets were, were a school for prophets. These were, these were men that were intentionally in training to become a prophet. And yet when God decides to pick Elijah's replacement, it wasn't the top of the class in the school of the prophets. In fact, it wasn't anybody in the school of prophets. They didn't even believe Elisha the sons of the prophets, the school of the prophets, they didn't even believe Elisha when they're, they're, they're trying to find Elijah. And Elisha's like, I know where he is. He gone. He, he's, he's gone. I think if I'm not mistaken, they spent three days. I think the Bible says they spent three days Trying to find Elijah, and Elisha told them, he's gone. I, I think the reason they spent three days was, I, how, there's no way you can know this. You're just the one that was pouring water on his hands. You, you're just the one that was the servant for the last seven or eight years. You weren't even in school. We were going to class learning how to prophesy. And all you were doing was following Elijah around, following the professor around, pouring water on his hands. And yet God says, Elijah, it's not somebody from this group that I want you to pick. There's somebody else that's been positioning themselves not to get a position, but to get in relationship. And I know how to get them from the field to the right place. I know how to get David from taking care of sheep to the place where the prophet is to anoint him. I know how to get Elisha from the field to the place where Elijah Elijah can pass the mantle to him. <laughs> Exodus chapter 17 verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses and Aaron Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were ready, were steady until the going down of the sun. And verse 13 says, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. I know there's no mistakes in the Bible. I believe the Word of God is the Word of God, and God doesn't make mistakes. But, but when you read the first couple of verses we just read there, Joshua didn't do it by himself. I mean, it says Joshua discomfited Amalek, but Joshua didn't discomfit Amalek without any support. Because if Moses' hands were up, they were winning. And if Moses' hands went down, they started losing. I don't know how much of that Joshua knew in the moment. I, I, don't, I don't know if he understood in the middle of the battle what was going on. I would venture to say that he was kind of naive to what was going, up, going on up on the mountain. 
I would suspect that he just thought, man, we can, we're winning and then we're losing. We're, what is going on? I tell you, it is the will of God not for generations to compete, but to complement. We're not called to compete. The younger generation is not called to compete with the older generation. If Moses would have sat up on that mountaintop and Aaron and Hur would have held his hands up, but nobody was down in the valley, there wouldn't have been a victory. And if Joshua was down in the valley fighting, but Moses' hands weren't held up, they'd have lost. You need both. I'm not in a competition. And I know some of you don't like it, and I'm, I'm starting to see the horizon a little bit myself, and I'm not too crazy about it. But sometimes you got to embrace that your job is not to be down in the battlefield anymore, but your job is to be either holding up your hands or helping somebody else hold up the hands so that the battle can be fought and be won. Joshua discomfited Amalek. Most of you have heard me preach enough. You know this. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I, I, I like in these stories, I like to try to put my imagination to it and just kind of in the circumstances think about what it would be like to be that individual. And, 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 and I, just, I just imagine that when Joshua laid down on his bed that night, it took a while to go to sleep. I just imagine that the adrenaline was still pumping and he was rehearsing that day and man, how awesome that was. And, and, and man, Moses, Moses picked me to lead the battle and I led the battle. I picked the men and we got a victory and man, that was something else. I, wow. And perhaps he thought, I must... Uh, I must be ready to get a promotion here pretty soon. I mean, look what I did. Look how well I did. Look how well I succeeded. No. Joshua, what you got was a part of what seems to be God's pattern. I tell you young people, you young adults something. God has a pattern. And typically the pattern is you get a taste. But it's just a taste. If you're not careful though, you get that taste and you think you've now arrived. I, I believe when that, when that mantle fell on Elisha, there was something that awakened inside of him. And, and, and he's, you know what, I don't, I don't want to do this with the rest of my life. I want to go after that. That's, that's, that's the right choice, Elisha. But just understand, that mantle's not yours right now. You got a taste of what God has for the future. But the fulfillment is not in the present. And it is absolutely critical what you do after you get the taste. And what you're supposed to do is work on positioning yourself with God. And not getting upset when you're not picked all the time to do this or do that. Or... Because after this... It's basically 40 years. 40 years that all Moses does, or excuse me, all Joshua does is serve Moses. In fact, according to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, he had become known as Moses' minister. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying... Do you know what that word minister means in the Hebrew? It means servant. 
after he led that first battle and they won, he didn't become the general in charge. He didn't become the second in command for Israel. He became Moses' minister to the point he is identified in the first verse of the first chapter of the book named after him as Moses' minister. Let me tell you something I've, I've heard a couple of times now. I don't know that I've heard it directly from anyone, but I, I've kind of heard it through the grapevine. There's some areas of ministry some folks don't want to get involved in because you're not willing to be known by that forever. I don't want to get stuck there. So therefore, you set the, you set the terms of... I'm only willing to do what's going to get me noticed. I'm only willing to do what I can feel like is positioning me to be seen. I'll tell you something. If you've got a God-given talent that it's not a common thing for everybody to have, you might want to be careful if you decide, I don't want to use that gift in ministry because I don't want to get stuck. Because you might end up losing the gift. What if Joshua would have said after that, after that battle and that great victory, you know what, I'm, I'm not willing to serve Moses. I might get stuck as being known as Moses' minister. <laughs> I might get relegated for the rest of my life. Everybody may always just see me as the servant. That's all they may ever view me as, is just the servant. And How am I ever going to get anywhere if I become simply known as Moses' servant? And yet when God identifies him, he says, uh, Moses' servant, Moses' minister. Because when you are positioning yourself in relationship with God and pursuing God, God is not going to overlook you. God is not going to forget about you. You don't have to go on a campaign. You don't need a campaign manager that's trying to promote you to a position. You just worry about getting yourself positioned. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. I, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I search me, God, and know my heart. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after Thee, O God. When the time comes... God knows how to send the prophet down the road where you are in the field. I'll tell you something, if you're sitting around waiting for the next ministry promotion and you're not being faithful to do what you are, where you are, you got this wrong. I'll never forget, I think I was a little, little bit into being co-pastor in 1998. I was... At the beginning, some of y'all were around then. I started preaching Sunday mornings pretty regularly, and Bishop was still doing nights and whatever, but I was leading what we called that time the mother congregation. And then those early couple of years that I became co-pastor, Brother Dan Trombley was on staff. He had come on staff, and, and uh, he, he, was, he was, at that point, he was a part of the, the mother congregation here, come here Sunday mornings, and and we started it was back in the old building. We had the foyer and all that. And so I, I don't remember where we got the idea, but we got the idea. And we, we started setting up a greeters area in the foyer on Sunday mornings. It was a table and a tablecloth with some brochures. And the greeters would stand out there. And, and Brother Trombley, I don't remember if he was in, I don't remember if he, what all he was over, if it was guest follow up or what it was. But. But Brother Trombley was the guy responsible for setting that table up every Sunday morning. 
And, and in the process of that, what was, I don't, I, there was a couple of things that was known by through the years, but at one point it was Brooklyn Park. The Brooklyn Park daughter work became in need of a, of a new leader. And Bishop felt led and went to Brother Trombley and asked him to consider it. And he did and agreed to go. And the, 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 the changes were made. And I don't, I don't remember how long this went on. If I'm not mistaken, it was several months. But for several, I think at least for several months before we could make a change, Brother Trombley, who was now in a position of leading a, a daughter work, would come by this building early Sunday morning, get out the table, put out the tablecloth, put out the brochures, and then go to his place of ministry. I really wouldn't have been shocked. I wouldn't have had bad feelings toward him. If at the, the day he became the leader of that group, if he'd have said, hey, can't do this job anymore. And yet, faithfully, until a change was made. You know, there's a principle in Scripture that if you can't be faithful in that which is least, you won't be faithful in much. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but... It may just be one person, but you need to get your eyes off of promotion. You need to get focused on positioning. I didn't say you need to get focused on a position, but on positioning. You need to get yourself focused on getting in the right place with God. Because when you do that, you can God, God knows exactly where you are. And He can get you to the right place at the right time. Go to the, to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed Jesus. And, and I want you to notice this next verse. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. And preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. He, he went around Galilee teaching in the synagogues. Which, which in essence was a gathering of religious people. <laughs> if I could say it this way, it was, it was, it was church. He, he went to the synagogue. He was in synagogues. But look at where he found the disciples. While he went to the synagogue to teach the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, he went to the lake to find disciples. He didn't go to church where there were some people potentially trying to get a position. He went to the place where there were people that were faithful to be doing what they were supposed to be doing. Can I tell you tonight that natural responsibilities, natural jobs become very spiritual if that is the place in which God has you. How many, where's, where's, how many of you are in college? Where's, where's college? I mean, you know, you basically don't have a choice but school, high school, whatever, theoretically. But college, one more, college. Let me see, current in college. Man, current. Yeah. 
Oh, did, who, who, are, who are here raise a hand? Currently in college, you go to college. I got a, I got a question, Jerry. You're at AACC, right? Yeah. When you're sitting there in class, did you sitting there thinking, "Boy, I'm, this is powerful. This is." No. Uh, yeah. You ever think, "What am I? Why am I here?" You ever think that? Yeah. Yeah. Any any of the rest of you? Ever think that from, I know you probably thought it from a natural standpoint, but I'm talking from a spiritual con. Why am I here? I know God's called me. You believe that? You can, okay, good, all right. God's, I know, I believe God's called me. Why am I sitting here and learning algebra or English or what? Yeah, right. Let me tell you something. When you're sitting in class, you're in one of the most spiritual places you could be. Because God uses natural circumstances, natural things to train you for spiritual ministry. I, I've told this many times one-on-one, and I think I've actually told it a couple of times now. But, but I can remember when I, after I became principal of Antioch Christian School, I was a little over halfway through college. I became principal of the school. And, and back in that day, if you know where Brother, Brother Mike Yu's office is, you, you go downstairs and into the foyer, he's that first door on the right. Well, the door at the bottom of the stairs and the first door on the right, originally when that was all built, that was all one open room. And when I became principal, I'd had an office in the other building. It was still standing. And I got moved over there, and that was the only available space. And I'm sitting there with a little desk in this big old room thinking, what in the world am I doing? I felt lost in there. And I can remember some days sitting at my desk in that office and thinking I, I was going to college, getting a business degree, and, and, and I had some peers. I was in my I don't know, around 24, 25, and I, I had some friends of mine that were already traveling full-time and preaching. I don't know this, this way as much anymore, but back in that day, man, if you were an evangelist preaching full-time and you had a fifth-wheel trailer, you had arrived. If you were pulling a fifth wheel, that means you were somebody. I had a couple of friends that had a trailer, and their calendar was booked up. And Declan, I'm sitting, and I'm, I'm sitting there as they're bringing in third and fourth graders. They just had a fight on the playground, and I got to break it up. I got to get to the bottom of the truth. <laughs> there was one time this we had this. He was a he was kindergarten or first grade, and probably really shouldn't have allowed him to be a student because he had some severe issues but out of burden and compassion and love and that kid they'd bring that kid in my office and he'd climb all over the place he'd pick he'd pick my uh some of my uh my my keepsakes up and like get ready to throw them and I'm definitely in those moments like god what in the world am I doing here climbing under my desk all this crazy stuff I should be preaching. That's what I'm called to do. I'll never forget years ago where what the mother writes office at the bottom of the stairs is my office. I was sitting in there one day. It's probably been 15 years or so ago. I'm sitting in there one day and counseling a, a married couple who had been married longer, much longer than I had church people who were having major issues to the point that a couple of days before they had to call the cops to break up the fight. And I'm sitting there one day and I'm talking to them and she's sitting there and tells one story and he sits there and tells a completely different story and all of a sudden light bulbs started going off. I have been here before. I've been in this exact situation before, except it was a fourth grader and a fifth grader 
who had had a fight on the playground. And he's telling one story, and he's telling a completely different story. The problem is that was a minor deal. This is a big deal. And light bulbs started going off on the number of things that I thought were just trivial, natural things, but were God-ordained things. You don't know exactly where your future is going to be in the kingdom. And you, you know what? I'm convinced you need to stop trying to figure it out. We spend so much time trying to figure out our calling, we're sitting doing nothing. You just start pursuing God and developing relationship with God. He may tell you what you're called to do, or He may just work on gradually positioning you there, and you end up there and don't even know how you got there. If you can't be faithful in the little things, you can't be faithful in much. I, I oh, must have been the Lord caused Nathaniel to get up and go out. I was about to pick on him again. I'll pick on him anyway. You know, I have to be careful. I don't his, I don't have his wife beat me up. So <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, as his dad or as his pastor, I don't, I don't presume to know what anybody's. I thought my job. If you don't find out and have confidence that you are called. My endorsement of your calling is not going to get you through the tough times. And I don't care what you're called to do and how great God's going to use you. There's going to be some difficult times. And in those times, you've got to know for yourself, God called me. It wasn't my pastor that called me. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't the youth pastor. It wasn't, it wasn't anybody. God called me. I, 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 I do believe that I can have a role in affirming your calling, but I don't think it's my job to tell you. So I feel that way with my own. I felt that way with my own kids. But I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. I don't think necessarily Nathaniel's called to be a worship leader the rest of his life. Oh, here he comes, just in time. Everybody welcome him back into the <laughs> sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I've been in that role for all my life. It's finally fun to get to give out what I've had to deal with with my dad, right? You know, so. But you know what? I know one thing. There's some, there's, there's some learning to discern the flow and the ministry of the Spirit that happens as he's up there behind that keyboard. Don't tell me you're worried about getting stuck someplace. Because if that's the place God has put you, it's for a purpose. I, I think, I think I've, I've said this, I think in, in the minister's training class and maybe other places before, and maybe even in service, but I don't recall. But I, I think there's two, there's two basic purposes for everything you're involved in ministry-wise. One purpose, which would seem pretty obvious, is you're in that role to minister. Whoever it is you're ministering to and whatever that role is, you're there to minister. But I believe the second purpose of everything God has you involved in is training and preparation for the future. But it's not your job to figure out what the future is so you can get there sooner. God knows what you need for the future. God knows how long you have to be developed. And God knows what needs to be developed. So if God's got you plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, you need to learn how to plow the straightest rows anybody's ever plowed. And if God's got you mending nets, you need to be the best net mender anybody's ever seen. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Because God's looking for faithful people. Is that not what's a part of the thing that's going to be said in eternity? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I believe from young to old in this room tonight, in this part of this congregation, people that may not be able to be here tonight. There are people that God has called and God has intended to use in some amazing ways and, 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 and put in some amazing positions. 
That's not what we're called to pursue. David didn't have a campaign manager. He wasn't out on the campaign trail. Vote for me. Vote for me. He's just out taking care of sheep. And God needs a king. And God knows there's this, there's this guy over here. He's just... He's just been pursuing me. He's just been hungering after me. And, and I know what I can do through him. And, and everybody else over here may have my attention. And, and, and everybody over here may be vying for a position uh, and, and for a title, for a role. But, but he's over here just trying to get in the right position with me. I know how to get... I, I, what, what did they say of, of, of the disciples or the apostles? I believe it was in the book of Acts. These are, these are ignorant and unlearned men. <laughs> these, these men that Jesus left this with, they, did, they didn't come from the synagogue. They weren't well trained in theological things. They they didn't have doctorates and masters of theology. They they, they just knew how to fish. They said, we recognize they may be ignorant and unlearned from a natural perspective, but they have been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. What are you pursuing? What's your focus? You're pursuing a position. You get upset if somebody gets chosen ahead of you. That that was that was that's that's my turn. That was that should be my solo. That should be my opportunity. If it's supposed to be your opportunity, rest assured, God knows how to get you there. And if you're convinced it's supposed to be your opportunity and somebody else gets it, gets it, you need to rest assured it wasn't yours. And the truth of the matter is, if you get the position, it's not yours. How is it that Paul can say, I, I've learned that whatever state I'm in, to be content? It was by understanding that I don't own this. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And if He puts me in a role to serve, a position, in a position to serve, I'll serve. But if I'm not in the position, I'm, I'm still going to serve. Would you, would you bow your heads, close your eyes? Can I, can I ask you? To do a little bit of heart searching here for a few moments. Can you, can you say as David said, Lord, one thing I'm desiring. One thing I desire. In essence, what he was kind of saying was, I, I just want relationship with you. I just want to know you. Paul said, I, I count everything, everything, the good things and the bad things. He said, I count it all as lost that I may win Christ. Not that I may gain a position, not that I may gain a role or a title, but I, I count it all as lost that I may win Christ. What are you trying to win tonight? What is it you've got your eyes, your heart set on that you're pursuing and trying to win? If it's anything but Jesus Christ, you need to, you need to refocus. Head bowed and eyes closed. I, I believe there might be some of you that need to kind of go a step further. And make your way down to this altar and talk to the Lord for a few minutes. You've got your eyes fixed on the next opportunity, the next position, the the next role, or do you have your eyes fixed? One thing. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. 
Can you be willing? Are you willing to be an Aaron and a Hur rather than a Moses? Anybody's willing to be Moses and be the guy that's the, the figurehead, but are you willing to just, if God decides that your role, your position is just to stand there and hold up the hands of another? If you're more about position, title, role than you are about positioning in the proper place with Him, you're, you're not going to be willing to do that. Come on now, and I believe there's some young people and some young adults in this place tonight that God has some positions and roles and places for you in the kingdom. Some of you, it's probably going to take you outside of this church. It's probably going to take you to other places. Maybe maybe it's a church planter. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a, a missionary. But if, And if that's what God wants, so be it. But your job is just to work on positioning yourself with God. God knows how to open the right doors at the right time. God knows exactly how to get you in the right place at the right time. Your job is to get to know Him. Your job is to pursue Him. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Ikaramando lobo shatala bahaya. Sikaramanda ye alalabo koromonde. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want to be in the right position with you, God, more than a natural position, more than a natural role. I want to be in right relationship with you, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, if you've got me out in a field plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, I want to I wanna be faithful to do that. Lord, if it's tending some sheep, ever notice what David did after he was anointed king? After. After David was anointed king. He didn't cease taking care of sheep. Some, you get your anointing and you're done with whatever you were doing. That's not what David did. David didn't go tell his dad, you know what, dad? I, you're going to have to find somebody else to take care of the sheep. I've I just been anointed king. He still went back. Still kept taking care of the sheep. I believe there's some of you here tonight, God's got you in a place of transition. God is in the process of moving you to that next position, that next place. Don't get so caught up on where you're going that you start neglecting where you are. Don't get so focused on the next step, the, the elevation, the promotion, that you start forsaking what you are still supposed to be doing where you are. In the name of Jesus. 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 Come on, I know this is this is not the most exciting, the most uplifting message, but you're gonna go where God's trying to take you. You gotta get the right foundation. Got to get the right mindset. Got to pursue the right things. In the name of Jesus. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Just a few more moments, please. Come on, even if you're just in your seat, would you just talk to the Lord right where you are? 
God, help me to have the right focus. Help me to get my eyes on the right things and keep it on the right thing. Help my pursuit to be you, God. Let my focus be you, God. Positioning myself with you. Seeking you. Hungering and thirsting after you, God. You can take care of the rest, Lord. You can work out the positioning. You can, you can work out the placement of getting me to where you want me in the role, in the position, the ministry. You can do all of that. I'm just going to, I want to focus on you, pursuing you. Positioning myself in relationship with you, God. Faithful to do the things you've given me to do in this season, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Perhaps there's some of you here tonight that you've been you've been trying to live what I've preached. Don't forget, God took Moses out into the wilderness for 40 years before he used him to lead Israel out of Egypt. 40 years for Joshua from the time he led that charge in that first battle till the time that was appointed to lead Israel. Somewhere, my understanding, somewhere around 13 years from the time David was anointed king before he actually assumed the throne. Don't let the enemy cause you to think if you're in that in-between time that God's neglected you, God's forsaken you may be a longer season than you hope for, may be a slower process than you want, but you can trust Him. You can trust Him. In the name of Jesus, 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 in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Jesus name there are those that are praying and may continue ask you to be mindful of that but whenever you're ready to go you're welcome to do so Jesus name